Please take your seats if you're here physically. So my name is Josh, I'm one of the leaders of, of Hope Church, and this morning we're going to take um, a bit of a break from our uh, Exodus series. As you know, we've been kind of started in Exodus, we've kind of been journeying through that, but today we are going to be celebrating Pentecost Sunday. Now this isn't always something that we've always done as a church, we've never always followed kind of the liturgical calendar, uh, but it's just really great just to pause, to take some time out, and to celebrate with what believers all around the world are also celebrating at this time that it might be an encouragement to us um, where, the, where this day that we think about um, uh, Pentecost when, when the spirit fell um, so kind of 40 days after when, when Jesus died when the, ga- when the disciples were gathered together uh, and they um, uh, encountered his presence that's what we'll, we'll be doing so um, if you've got your Bibles with you we'll be in Acts chapter 2 and just before we get into God's word this morning just to give you an update on things regarding uh, Church on the Marsh quickly is that we are starting to gather uh, weekly from, from this afternoon. So uh, we're going to start to gather on Sundays at 4 p.m. at the Marsh Community Center physically. Um, so um, please be praying for us. And hey, if you've got a heart for church planting, if you've got a heart for the Marsh area um, or, or, for, or for working just, just, just for people who are, who are lost, who want to know the gospel, if you, if you want to at all are interested, just get in touch if you want to be a part of that, then you are totally free to come and, to come and get involved. But please be praying for us as we start to, to begin this journey of gathering regularly and just seeing what God does. Um, and we're just praying that yeah, God's presence is with us and that he establishes and builds his church uh, in, a, in a community as well in, in, in Lancaster. So just before we get in, also get into the word, I don't know what you guys did yesterday, uh, we went for um, a walk with my uh, extended family, um, some of my family that I haven't seen in a long time. It was good to be uh, united back together. It was good to spend some time with each other. We went for a, a pub meal. We had to sit on individual tables, uh, but then we went, went for a walk after. And it was just great for the whole family to be united back together. Uh, and in, in a similar way, this is what is happening really at Pentecost. Um, I know that often we, we think about Pentecost and the arrival of the Spirit and the supernatural gifts and wonders that, that he does at that time. But if we were just to draw back and look at, look at the bigger picture that, that God is sending the Holy Spirit to bring unity to his people, to unite the church back to God and to each other as well. And so this morning I want to sp- speak about the spirit of unity. So let's get into the, the passage. So Acts chapter 2 and we'll read from verse, from verse 1. It says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they, had, when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them speaking in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, uh, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene. Visit- visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to, to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they've had too much wine, as you know, many people would criticize and, and, and have a bit of a laugh at this moment. Verse 14, then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews, all of you who are living in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. This is, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire, billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, and before the coming of the, um, before the, coming of the great and glorious day, of the Lord, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
Amen. So I guess we need to really ask the question is kind of what is happening at Pentecost? You know, what is happening in this moment? You know, it's very, it's very descriptive of, of, you know, of the details of what is specifically happening. But, but why is this happening? You know, what's the significance of it? Really, we must ask the question that they also asked. You know, what does this mean? You know, like, so what? You know, what has this all got to do within the context of Scripture? And I guess really what we know of Pentecost is, is that two kind of things are happening, two main things are happening. One, the Holy Spirit has uh, arrived, that Jesus has gone, he's, he's ascended back up to heaven to be with the Father, and he has sent the Holy Spirit down on his people. So the Holy Spirit has come, and he started to indwell believers. So one, the Holy Spirit arrives. That's what we know of what Pentecost is. That's what we celebrate. But two also, is that it's the beginning of the church. It's the birth of the church, that, the, that, that before this point, it was just Jesus and his disciples, Jesus and his, and his crowds, but now we started to see, okay, this is where the church officially starts, this is where the church you know, has its conception from day one, you know, believers who have faith in Jesus Christ and have the indwelling Holy Spirit, you know, New Testament believers, and we are part of that, it's the beginning of a new age in which we are part of that. So it's the arrival of the Holy Spirit, and it's the birth of the church, but really these are one and the same thing. The arrival of the Spirit and the birth of the church are one and the same thing, because really the church are really just people, believers, who have professed faith in Christ and have the indwelling Spirit. In fact, we cannot be the church if it is not for the Spirit. The church does not exist if it isn't for the Spirit of God indwelling in believers and drawing them back to the Father. That's what the church is about. We define the church as you know, believers, disciples of Jesus Christ who have professed faith in Christ and now as a sign of that have the indwelling spirit within them, a seal, a, a deposit guaranteeing their inheritance. So the church cannot exist within, w- without the spirit. So what is really happening is that the spirit has come down to kind of give birth to the church, to give birth to this new age. So what God is doing at this moment, he's, he's pouring out his spirit onto his people. He's pouring out his presence onto his people that they might become the church. That's why Peter quotes from Joel. He says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. And he's doing this for a purpose. And, you know, and he's not just doing this so that we might just enjoy the benefit of the Holy Spirit, even though that is great. You know, he's not just doing this so that they might experience the signs and the wonders and the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit. You know, one of the great tragedies of the church is that we have often limited or we have often focused the role of the Holy Spirit just to its supernatural signs and wonders without even really giving thought as to what the Holy Spirit is doing within the redemptive history of Scripture, within the redemptive history of mankind, that there is such a, such a bigger thing going on in what the Holy Spirit is doing in and through the church. This is why P- Peter finishes Joel's quote by saying, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing. The Holy Spirit is going out into all the earth that he might start to gather believers from every generation, from every tribe, tongue, and nation, drawing them back to the Father, opening their hearts to the gospel that he might create a people for himself in which the Holy Spirit dwells and, and, and brings glory back to God. So God is pouring out his spirit that he might start to to gather believers from every generation, from every tribe, tongue, and a nation. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing. The Holy Spirit is being, is being missional. The Holy Spirit is starting to, to bring about a sense of unity. It's not just for entertainment. It's just not just for experience. The Holy Spirit kind of has a mission. It has, has an objective, and it's to gather God's people for God. Now, this is kind of like the great reversal of what we see at the Tower of Babel. If you remember, cast your mind back into Genesis, uh, uh, Genesis 11, where we see the Tower of Babel, where we see mankind kind of building this great big tower to the heavens, and them saying, hey, let us build a tower in our own name, you know, for our own glory, so that people might know who we are, you know, not, not of any part of God. What does God do? God comes to them and he says hey I don't like this that you're doing it without me that that, that you're trying to take glory away from me or doing it for your name uh, alone and and so what does God does he he confuses them God brings confusion and he and he um, he brings confusion through multiple languages so that they don't understand each other and so they are driven away they are scattered because God brings about a confusion of languages 
And then what we see at Pentecost, we see a great reversal of this going on, is that God now brings the Holy Spirit. He gives them ability to speak in different languages, and suddenly there's, a, there's this amazing sense of unity. Suddenly they all understand each other. That, you know, we, we just read it. They start to say, hey, I, I, I hear people praising God uh, and speaking in a different language. You know, People who have come from all around the world, people who have just totally different foreign contexts and foreign languages, and yet they all understand each other. Yet we, we hear them praise in our own native tongue even though they're from a country you know hundreds and hundreds of miles away and, and, that, and that's the amazing thing is that that's what God is doing God is bringing about a sense of unity that's why for any of you that have ever been on like an overseas mission where you've been to a foreign country with a foreign language you know a foreign context completely different to what you know here but yet you, you've gone to and be a set of believers who profess, pr- pr- um, profess faith in Christ who have the indwelling spirit, and instantly you just have a sense of unity. Why? Because because it's that spirit of unity between you. Is that even though language might be a barrier, even though culture might be a barrier, there is such an amazing sense of unity between you because we have the indwelling spirit. So that's what the Holy Spirit is doing. Is bringing unity. He's starting to to gather the church together. It's such a bigger picture than what we often often uh, pull it down to. And not only is the Holy Spirit drawing us together, drawing us together back to God, he's also transforming us into worshippers. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing in and through our life. He's transforming us and, and making us into worshippers. Now notice what happens when the Spirit falls and what's the result of this. So the, so the Spirit comes down onto the disciples, to all those that are gathered there. They start to speak in different tongues, but they don't just start to say random things. You know, they don't just start to ask, you know, please can you show me the way to the train station? You know, like you learn in German when you're in primary school or high school, you know, you start to learn certain phrases in different languages. You know, the Holy Spirit is not, not about that. It's not, just start to, it's not just there to bless them. It says in verse 11, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing. The Holy Spirit is making us and fashioning us into worshippers. We are moved to declare the wonders of God in multiple languages. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing. He's, he's, he's uniting them. He's, he's, he's making them into a body of believers. And what is the result of that? Is that they just start to praise God. They just start to worship God and glorify God and declare his wonders. And that, that's the unity that God is seeking. That's the unity of the church that God is really seeking where people from every tribe, tongue, and nation, people from every generation are gathered to de- together to declare the wonders of God and to bring him glory that's the ultimate purpose of the church that he might dwell with them forever and we get a picture of that in revelation in john's vision in revelation in chapter 7 he says after this i looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation tribe tongue standing before the throne and before the lamb and they cried out in a loud voice salvation belongs to our god who sits on the throne and to the lamb All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honour and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. That's just this amazing picture of of what, what God is wanting to do with and through the churches gather his people together that they might be in that place one day and we will be standing in that multitude. When Jesus returns and, and when God rolls up, you know, rolls up time as we know it, and we will stand in that multitude and we will declare the praises of God together. And we can even do that now as a church. So the Holy Spirit puts us in a posture as worshippers. He's transforming us into greater and greater worshippers as we submit to him, as we live um, in relationship uh, with him. And the thing is, when we commit ourselves to worshiping God, when we commit ourselves to glorifying God, when we make that the priority of our life, then there can be unity. When we lift that purpose above every other difference, above every other preference that we have in our life, then we can start to really pursue unity because we hold that as a priority. We start to say, okay, well, God wants us to be his worshipers. God wants us to glorify him with our lives. And so when we commit to doing that above all else, then there can be unity amongst us and between other believers. Lately, I've been reading a, church, I mean, reading, a, a, reading a book this week. It's a great book. It's called Until Unity by Francis Chan. Now, if you've ever read 
Letters to the Church by Francis Chan. You, you'll love this. It's a great book. Uh, and something just, what, just something really stirred my heart in by what he said this, um, in, in, even in just in the introduction. He says, our lack of praise may actually be the biggest cause of our divisions. Once we stop worshipping, all hope for unity is lost. This is what unites us. We can't stop talking about the treasure we have in Jesus. It's hard to start an argument with someone who is on her knees shouting praises to Jesus, especially when you're busy praising the Lord as well. Many of our problems could be reconciled if we discussed our concerns on our knees before a holy God. We can't allow the enemy or our enemies to interrupt our praise. Worship is our path to unity. How awesome is that? And that's really what God is desiring. God is desiring to unite us as a people that collectively we worship and we glorify God together. Worship is our path to unity. Yet isn't it ironic that even in the local church, worship can be one of the things that we fall out with each other the most? I mean, besides maybe like the treasurer of the church, often like the worship leaders often get the most flack and criticism, you know, throughout the history of the church. Why? Because we have such a wide preference in worship songs, don't we? We have a, such a wide preference in worship styles. You know, some like the worship to be quite short and punchy. Some quite like it to be quite long and drawn out. Some like older hymns. Some like the new contemporary songs. Some like to sing just a regular bank of, of regular songs that, that we know very well. Some like new songs that we want to try out and try something different. And yet this is something that we argue over and how how crazy are it how uh, ironic is it that the thing that is meant to unite us as a body of believers is often the thing that we fall out over the most and it, it, because often we we bring our preferences into it or we elevate our preferences and our in our opinions instead of just allowing our hearts to glow in worship to God whereas really that should just override everything else so worship is the thing that brings unity so I just pray that as a church we would move forward as a as a worshiping community that we would just ma- maintain that, man, worshipping God, glorifying God together, holding that above all else is what will enable us to be a united people along with other, other believers, other Christians. So what we can see is that really the Holy Spirit is really the agent of unity. He's really the agent of unity. Now, some of you might have like a bit of an objection in your mind and think, okay, well, I hear what you're saying, Josh, but isn't, isn't Jesus the, 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 you know, the person that we unite around? Isn't, isn't Jesus the one that we kind of ultimately unite around? Well, granted, yes, he is. But 1 Corinthians 12, it says, no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So even gospel fundamentals, even the ABCs of being a Christian, we can, even, we, can, we can only even actually believe these things or have faith in these things if it were not for the Holy Spirit opening our hearts to the gospel. In partnership with the Holy Spirit, the, the, you know, the Holy Spirit gives us revelation to the scriptures that we might have faith in Christ, that, we, that, we might, you know, that the Holy Spirit is working on our hearts and as we express faith in Christ, you know, it's a... It, it, it's, it's union, so, you know, so no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And that's why in Ephesians 4, Paul says, make every effort, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Now notice how he doesn't say, make every effort to keep the unity of doctrine or the unity of the Bible or the unity of Scripture through the bond of peace. He says, keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And the reason why is because we need the Holy Spirit to come and interpret the scriptures anyway. We can't even approach the Bible without um, asking the Holy Spirit, without allowing the Holy Spirit to reveal the scriptures to us uh, and to give us insight to them that we might not just make it mean whatever we we want it to mean. And also is that if we were to say, um, you know, make every effort to keep the unity of scripture or of doctrine or theology... When, would never be united, <laughs> because even though we might, even though we might, you know, unite on the on the fundamentals of what it means to be a Christian or, or on gospel priorities, man, you know, Christians just kind of fall out and disagree and divide, you know, on secondary, tertiary, you know, loads of different issues that you know, you know, have have less significance and importance than the gospel priorities. So even when we come to the even when we come, come to the scripture, you know, I'm not saying that we need to disregard theology or we disregard doctrine. No, we hold that highly. But our first step to pursuing those things is in humble submission to the Holy Spirit. That's what must come first. If we are to be a united people, if we want to unite with other churches and, and, and reach this city and reach this nation for Jesus Christ, man, we've got to say, 
you know, our first priority. It's just in humble submission to the Holy Spirit. And then in humility and submission to the Holy Spirit, then we might start to approach Scripture. We might start to approach other things in life and in our culture that we might start to, to work towards those as a united people. So we, we, when we strive to submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit, then there can be unity. That's what I just really want to call you guys to and encourage you guys to is say, man, am, am I in submission to the Holy Spirit? Am I allowing the Holy Spirit to mold me, to shape me, to stir me? Am I allowing him to teach me? Or am I kind of starting to resist him a little bit? Now, not only is the Holy Spirit uniting us all back to God. You know, the Holy Spirit has gone out and he's gathering all believers. He's awakening believers' hearts in every generation from every tribe, tongue, and nation back to God. But he's also uniting us to each other, right? He's bringing unity within all of us as corporately. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul is describing the ministry or the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's the famous passage where he talks about the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit. But most importantly, in verses 11 and 13, he says... He says, all these are the work of one of the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. We were all baptized in by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we were all given one spirit to drink. So the Holy Spirit is uniting us together as a spiritual body, and we play a part of that living body. And the more we drink of the Holy Spirit, the more we submit ourselves to his presence, the more we allow him to shape us, to stir us, to mold us, to teach us and to challenge us, the more we are a blessing to that body. The more you are a blessing to this body uh, as as a local church. If you are a part of this local church or you want to be a part of this local church, and we we really want you to want you to do so and to be so, then you know to, 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 to live in submission to the Holy Spirit, because when you do so, you will be a blessing. To this, to this body and to the wider body of believers. Put it this way. Th- think of someone right now in your life that you know of. Maybe it's someone that you know personally. Maybe it's someone that you, you don't know personally but that you know of. Think of someone right now who you is just on fire for Jesus and who is just a real encouragement to your faith. Let, let that person just pop into your head right now. Now here's the thing. Doesn't the very thought of that person doesn't their very presence in your life just stir your heart towards Jesus in a greater way? Doesn't it just stir your affections towards God in a greater way? And, and that's crazy because even just, even just a thought of them or even just their presence in your life can have such an influence, can have such an encouragement to your faith without even them you know, having, you know, giving you a direct encouragement or a, a, you know, giving direct teaching. But like you look at them and you just think, wow, they, they, they are someone sold out for, for God because they're, they're fervent in prayer. Why? Because they're committed to the Bible. Why? Because they're, they're passionate about preaching the gospel or because they're, they're just so sensitive to the Holy Spirit or they're just so loving and caring. That's what happens. That's what it means to be part of a living body is that when you submit yourselves to the Holy Spirit, when God starts to awaken your soul to all that he wants to do in and through your life, you get blessed. But at the very same time, we get blessed. Because people see you, people see the change in your life, people see your faith, and that makes them want to commit to God and, and, to, and to allow the Holy, Holy Spirit to shape them, shape them as well. So let it be said of your life, let it be said of all of our lives, that when people think of us, when people remember us, or even just our presence in their life, might stir their affections towards Jesus in a greater way. That's what it means to be part of a living, a living body. So we need to remember that that ultimately we are made in the image of God, that we are a united uh, body. And we need to hold that unity highly if we are to want to see each other excel, if we are want to see each other grow in our gifts and in the graces of God. You know, people by their very nature bear the image of God on their lives, which is crazy, isn't it? You know, um, Jamie and Emily said something like that before at the start, is that, you know, we're all made in the image of God. We are, and as believers, we have the indwelling spirit, which is just so amazing. We just take that for granted sometimes. And yet we can be so quick to judge, to criticize, to slander, to condemn. And yet someone is, we are made in the image of God and we bear the presence of God inside of us. Imagine if one of your friends had a baby recently, or well, there's been lots of babies born recently, so just think about one of them. <laughs> Imagine one of your friends had a baby recently, and you went round to their house, now that you can, um, to, go, to go and visit them and to go and say hi. Imagine if you looked at that baby and started to point out some of the flaws in it, <laughs> and said, well, it's got a bit of a big nose, 
he's got pointy ears, he's got a bit of a dro- droopy eyes. You just, you, I mean, you, you'd feel the wrath of the parents, right? You, 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 you'd be kicked out of that house before you could even take a sip of your cup of tea. I mean, you just wouldn't do that. You just wouldn't do that. One, because they are that person's child. You know, like how can you just criticize and condemn and, and, and slander someone else's child? But also, they're made in their parents' image. So if you're going to say that baby looks pretty ugly, well, the parents must be pretty ugly as well to produce such an ugly baby. You know, but that's, but that's what we do to each other. That's what we do to other brothers and sisters in Christ. Is that we, we can be so quick to, to criticize and condemn and to slander and to point out fault. But they are a person made in the image of God. They are a person who bears God's image just because they're human. That they bear God's image. There's a Jewish proverb. And it's a proverb, so it's not scripture. It's just a, a Jewish proverb. But it says, Before every person walks an angel announcing, Behold, the image of God. Is that what God has done with humanity? It's just so far above the rest of creation. That he is, you know, the rest of creation does not bear his image. It bears his creative design. But humanity bears God's image. And yet we can just be so quick to pull each other down and to slander each other. And even more so, even on top of that, as believers, we have the indwelling presence of God. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us. And let's not just you know brush past that the holy spirit the third person of the triune god lives inside every one of us and yet we can so easily criticize condemn slander each other whether people on tv or the christians that we know or people even in our own church imagine if if you time if you were to time travel and go back two thousand years and meet mary pregnant with jesus imagine meeting mary pregnant with jesus on her way to to bethlehem wouldn't you just like treat, and you, you knew that she was pregnant with Jesus, and you knew who Jesus was going to be, or, and, and was. Wouldn't you just treat her with such a sense of honor? Wouldn't you treat her with such a sense of reverence? You'd be like, whoa, you know, like, dwelling inside of you is, is God, is, is the living God dwelling within you. Wouldn't you just treat her with such a sense of reverence and honor? Like, oh. <clears throat> but isn't that what me and you are? Aren't we people who have the Holy Spirit God dwelling within us, and yet we just, man, we, we can treat each other so poorly. We can treat each other with such, such disgrace sometimes. And I'm not thinking about specifically in here. I think, you know, generally we're, we're, we're quite a loving church, but, we've, you know, we've, we've got a long way to go. Man, so, like, you know, God is uniting us as a people, and we need to recognize that, you know, what he has invested in our lives, just in the fact that we are human and, and we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. Man, we should hold each other with such a sense of honor and reverence. And if we want to pursue unity, then we need to start, we need to, start to value each other as such and to say, man, I don't, want to, um, I don't want to condemn, I don't want to criticize, I don't want to po- call out fault. How dare I say anything against the Lord's anointed? we are all anointed by the Holy Spirit. So if we want to be caught up in all that God is doing, if we want to be caught up in, in all that God is doing in the, in the redemptive history of mankind and how the Holy Spirit is drawing humanity back to God, if how the Holy Spirit is awakening people's hearts to the gospel and drawing us to each other and even fixing some of the, the, the disunity even in our own life, you know, we need to allow him to shape us. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to convict us, to teach us, to humble us. But therein often lies the problem, doesn't it? Is that we often so easily resist the Holy Spirit. In Acts 7, when Stephen is addressing the Sanhedrin, he challenges them you know, in, their, in their sin. He says, you stiff-necked people, you are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. And yet we do the same thing sometimes, don't we? We harden our hearts. We stiffen our necks and we resist the Holy Spirit's promptings in our life. And so I'll just ask you this morning, how is the Holy Spirit prompting you? How is the Holy Spirit stirring you? Are you, are you, are you kind of brushing those aside? Are you holding your hand out against the Holy Spirit and say, I, d- I don't want to go there, God. I, d- I don't want to address that issue. I'd rather just ignore it and pretend that you're not prompting me, that you're not speaking to me. So let's not block up our ears this morning. Let's not harden our hearts. Let's not stiffen our necks. But man, just in willing, humble submission, we just submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit and we say, God, would you shape us? Would you unify us? Would you teach us and mold us for your glory that we might be a people for your pleasure? Let's have the band up as I finish. 
We're going to move into a time of response now, and we're gonna, we'll take communion as well. But I just want to create some space and, and for you to ask that question in your own life. Where is there a sense of disunity? Where is there a sense of brokenness? Where is there something that's fractured in your life? And how can the Holy Spirit start to minister to that? How can the Holy Spirit start to bring unity to that? Maybe it's your fractured marriage. Maybe it's your broken relationships. Maybe it's your past hurts. Maybe it's your frustration with people or your your resentment against the church. Maybe you're angry with God about something. Maybe you feel like he's let you down and you feel like you've got a fractured relationship. Maybe it's your disunited self. Maybe it's your irrational thoughts. Maybe it's your overwhelming anxiety or your crippling insecurities. Whatever it is, Let's just lay it at the feet of Jesus this morning. Let's bring it to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, we submit ourselves to you. Whatever disunity there is in my life, whatever fractured relationships or hurt there is in my life, you are the one who can bring unity. You are the one who can restore me back to God, who can restore me back to, to, to wholeness. So let's stand this morning. Let's pray, let's respond, and we'll move into a time of communion. Lord Jesus, we just thank you that you sent the Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, we just submit ourselves to you right now. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you are the God of unity. And we just pray, Holy Spirit, would you unify us? Lord, that when we look out, God, at the universal church fractured into thousands of denominations, God, and even us, and even in our own lives, God, we see, we see brokenness, we see separation, we see division, we see a lack of unity. God, would you bring unity? So God, we just submit ourselves to you now. Would you mold us? Would you shape us? And God, to everyone that is here physically, to everyone here that is watching online, I just pray, Holy Spirit, would you just speak specifically into every single life, into every single heart, addressing any sense of disunity, addressing any, any sense of brokenness, that you might bring whole, wholesomeness, that you might bring wholeness to their life. And if you're here, just listen to that voice. Just li- listen to those promptings. Open your heart to the Holy Spirit right now and listen to what he has to say. Listen to what he has to prompt you with. God, would you bring unity to us as we worship you in Jesus' name.